Okay, hi everyone, it's the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our next fall meeting press conference. This is 29 and Counting, latest NASA Juno mission science results. I'm Lauren LaPuma from the AGU Media Relations Office and I'll be moderating today. So our panelists today are Heidi Becker from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Scott Bolton from Southwest Research Institute, Tristan Guillaume from the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur, Candace Hansen from the Planetary Science Institute. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. The slides from this presentation will be available in the Fall Meeting Media Center later today. And this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted to AGU's YouTube channel under the playlist Fall Meeting 2020 Press Conferences. And my colleague Liza will put those links in the chat box of this event. After the formal presentations and Q&A portion ends, we will open up an informal 30-minute discussion room via Zoom so that any reporters who want to stick around and have some more discussion and chat with the panelists can do so. And uh, we will post the link to this discussion room in the chat box and the meeting ID and passcode as well. And they are also on this slide. And if you have any questions or technical difficulties at any point, just email us at news at agu.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott, our first panelist. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Juno's press conference. Uh, we have some exciting results uh, to show you. Um, today's theme is, is all about Jupiter's atmosphere, uh, the dynamics, and uh, the, how important the beautiful storms that you can see on our, our images are to actually, uh, and, uh, to Jupiter's overall dynamics and even the deep atmosphere. So we're gonna talk about some of the discoveries that we've made as well as a model of how to explain some of those discoveries, in particular, the deep atmosphere. And then we'll end with uh, some more recent images that we have that are spectacular, high resolution pictures of some of the polar cyclones and the other storms around Jupiter, as well as how some of our citizen scientists are actually connecting uh, science with art and, uh, and how Juno enables that. Uh, Jupiter is such an incredible palette uh, for the artists. So let me start um, by first giving you an idea of how Juvenile's orbit is evolving, which is giving us uh, different perspectives. And a lot of that is enabling new science as well as uh, great new views. So here you see a picture of Jupiter and two uh, uh, parts of our elliptical trajectory uh, as we pass by Jupiter. So this is called the perigeo. These are the close approach to Jupiter. Our, our orbit is elliptical and we go far away from Jupiter. And then when we get in close, this is the geometry uh, that we have. So the gray line represents the very first perigeo from when we arrived at, at Jupiter uh, back in 2016 on July. And uh, you can see the first perigeo, uh, the closest approach was just near the equator uh, represented by four degrees north. So that's the latitude, four degrees north. And then we move uh, that perigeo from, Ju from Jupiter's gravity kind of twists our orbit around, the ellipse around, so that at each orbit, that perigeove and the location, uh, in particular the latitude that we pass over Jupiter at closest approach is moving north. So PJ34 represents the last orbit of our prime mission, which is scheduled in July of this year, 2021, uh, next year, I should say. And uh, you can see that it's moved from four degrees north up to 28 north. And so that means that we're seeing the Northern Hemisphere uh, more close up. Now you don't see a lot of difference, a little bit between the gray and the blue at 28 North, but there's a drastic difference as you get over the poles. And uh, as the orbit continues to progress, it'll just keep getting closer and closer to that pole and we'll get higher and higher resolution views. So a lot of what we're gonna show you is some of what's happening with the high resolution views that we're getting of the Northern Hemisphere, which is just amazing. Uh, okay, so I'd like to also first start off by kind of updating last year's uh, press conference where we gave sort of a weather report um, on Jupiter's polar cyclones. Uh, so can I get the next first uh, slide? Okay, this shows you uh, an image from uh, uh, February of 2017 where we went over the South Pole and you could see these five polar cyclones and you'll watch them evolve as this is a year later, February 2018. And last year we showed that it looked like a sixth cyclone was, gonna, was entering into this pattern of five that's shaped like a pentagon. And uh, right after we gave that, 
press conference back in uh, in December of last year, you're going to see the the view come up uh, where you see the six cyclone. Uh, we watched it sort of get kicked out. It was a baby cyclone. There it is in November, and by December you can see that it's it's either getting larger, but then it starts to get pushed out. Uh, by July of 20, uh, by November, it's back to five, and so. This is one of the most amazing things. We discovered these polar cyclones both in the south and in the north. And the south has five uh, surrounded, uh, surrounding a central one. And the north, we have eight of them surrounding a central one. And a, there are a lot of fundamental questions. It's the first time any spacecraft or any uh, observer has been able to see the poles of Jupiter. And uh, it was unique. It has these polar cyclones. Scientists are, are puzzled. How do these... Uh, get organized in this geometric configuration. How long do they stay that way? So we've watched for a few years. We see that a sixth one tried to get in, but then got booted out. Um, and uh, and what makes them stable? How long are they? So that's part of what Juno's exploring now. And uh, I, and it's still changing. And, one, and there are a number of scientific papers at this conference and also in the works of getting published that deal with not only the geometric configuration and how stable they are, but the fundamental question of why don't they merge? Uh, a lot of uh, basic science would suggest that they should merge into one, but they haven't. And uh, so these are some basic questions and we'll probably give you additional weather reports, maybe on a more routine basis, because as we watch these change, it's a little bit like watching the hurricane seasons on the earth. Okay, so uh, the next slide I'd like to show is, is a close-up. Uh, this is actually a, a, a picture um, from 2019 that shows a very stormy region. Uh, this is not atypical at Jupiter. It's a very typical type of storm. These are the atmospheric dynamics. This picture was made by uh, one of our citizen scientists who does some of the best work, Sean Duran, and he and you can see in this, not only the big cyclone in the center and all of these, uh, this palette of dynamics, almost like a Van Gogh painting, but you can also see these little white pop-up clouds that are just uh, to the north and to the right side of that main cyclone. In fact, there's a number of these white pop-up clouds. These are sitting above uh, the other cloud base. You can actually blow this up and see um, shadows. These are where we think there's a lot of uh, storms that are happening, thunderstorms and, uh, and lightning are, are probably associated with this. And one of the themes that we're going to have today is, is all about how important those storms are and some of the discoveries we've made. So basically I, at Jupiter, one of the puzzles that Juno discovered was that there was a lot of variability deep down. And when people first thought, of, when, before Juno arrived at Jupiter, uh, most of the theories about Jupiter's atmosphere were based off of the Earth and, uh, and how our atmosphere dynamics works and how our meteorology works. And of course, Jupiter has a fundamental difference. At Earth, underneath the, the atmosphere, you have um, either land or, or sea. And at Jupiter, it's just gas all the way down. So that's a real big difference. And what we found is, is that there's a lot of variability. Uh, on Earth, as soon as you pop down below the cloud tops, most of the meteorology and weather turns off. At Jupiter, that's not true. You go below, below the cloud tops, it's still very active. We discovered a lot of variability. And so we're gonna be showing some of that. Um, in fact, the next speaker, uh, Heidi Becker, will show you some of the discoveries associated with the uh, lightning that's coming from a very high altitude, higher than anybody had theoretically predicted. And, uh, and then Tristan Guillot will be talking about uh, how lightning and thunderstorms can affect the deep atmosphere and uh, maybe even be uh, forming what we call mushy hail that explains some of the puzzling aspects that we've seen of the deep atmosphere. Before I leave this topic and turn it over to, to other people, I want to just, uh, the other speakers, let me just go and show you one example of the next slide, which is almost the same exact image processed in a more colorful way. So this is, this is done maybe for a more artistic sense. And uh, you can see that it's incredibly beautiful and, and uh, sort of ready to hang on your wall. It looks like a, a great painting. Um, but what I want to point out is, is that while this is much more maybe artistic in the sense that it's, uh, it's done a, a more extreme color stretch, uh, this is actually useful scientifically. Um, the first color stretch showed us these white 
pop-up clouds. This color stretch shows you a lot more dynamics that are going on. And these colors are real. I mean, they're, they're stretched, but they represent either changes in composition to the atmosphere or different altitudes of the different cloud layers. And so scientists use these, these artistic pictures to actually do science with them. And so this is, a, is one example. You'll see more from Candy when she shows you some other artistic science. But uh, artistic expressions of our data, um, but they're actually, it is really science meeting art. And, um, and so I wanted to emphasize that. Um, the next up is this Candy's going to show you at the, not next up, but I'm sorry, uh, at the end, Candy's going to show you many, do, many new uh, high resolution images of the polar cyclones as well as the art. So I want to turn it over to Heidi next to let you, uh, her describe to you the high altitude lightning and, and how important it is to our understanding of Jupiter. Thanks, Scott. Okay, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, you know, Scott said Juno's discovered a very unexpected and very different kind of lightning on Jupiter. And this uh, illustration is an artist's conception of the extreme uh, energetic storm activity on Jupiter that we think is responsible for it. And what we've observed are very small lightning flashes that are coming from extremely high altitudes in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. It's a place where it's too cold for liquid water to exist, which was surprising. Um, the region's actually about 10 to 16 miles above the very top of Jupiter's water cloud. And the temperatures get as cold as minus 88 degrees Celsius. Um, so what that means is that this lightning that we're seeing is nothing like the kind of lightning that we have on our backyards at Earth, where you have liquid water droplets that collide with water ice crystals and they become charged and electrify water cloud thunderstorms. But um, we realized that where we were seeing the shallow lightning is a very special region of Jupiter's upper atmosphere where an interesting chemistry can take place because of the ammonia that's in Jupiter's atmosphere. And it's a place where, as you see in this figure, only Jupiter's most extreme high-reaching thunderstorms can reach. And they can loft water ice crystals up to these high altitudes at speeds of 100 to 200 miles per hour. And when those crystals hit the ammonia vapor, the ammonia acts like an antifreeze and lowers the melting point of the water, kind of letting it become a new ammonia water liquid, kind of like a Windex. So, you can almost think of it like Windex raindrops colliding with water ice crystals and charging up to create the conditions necessary for lightning. So if we go to the next slide, what we're seeing here is Juno's first observation of shallow lightning on Jupiter. And the context shot shows you the northern region where we made the observation. And there's Jupiter's northern oral oval over there on the day side. And you can see the cloud tops uh, in the image, even though we're looking at the dark side, because Jupiter's moon Io is actually casting its moonlight onto Jupiter at that time. And what's important are the two bright spots on the right part of the image. And those are the first two detected shallow lightning flashes. And what's really important about lightning is the size of those spots on the cloud tops because that's what's proportional to the depth of the lightning in the atmosphere. The idea is that the deeper the lightning is, the further the light spreads out as it's coming up through the clouds and being released to space. So deeper lightning has bigger spots on the cloud tops. And ever since Voyager took the first image of lightning on Jupiter in 1979, it was assumed all of Jupiter's lightning was in the deep water cloud because the spots that were being observed were larger. Um, and really it's because all of the other missions that came before Juno observed Jupiter from much further away and there were limitations to the cameras that were doing the observations. So let's look a little bit closer at this image on the next slide and give it a bigger view. And the reason Juno, only Juno has had the resolution to see shallow lightning is because of those close flybys that we make to the clouds. And also it's because we're using our stellar reference unit navigation camera as the science instrument for it. Um, the SRU is a very sensitive low light camera because it was built to detect dim stars for navigation. And the optics of the camera deliberately spread out the signal of small 
point sources of light so that it can make more precise star position measurements. And you can see that happening with the lightning flashes and those little insects there. Um, and it was that engineering property of the camera that allowed us to identify shallow lightning and make the science discovery with this engineering camera. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide and talk about GenoCam because GenoCam is also bringing something to the table here. Um, what you see is a cyclonic storm feature on Jupiter that was seen by Hubble um, on the left there, much smaller, and then in high resolution by JunoCam in the center. And um, it's a very big storm system. It's almost the size of the United States. But if you look at the inset that's in the lower right there, you can see these bright, high-reaching storms that Scott was mentioning that rise above the surrounding features. And we believe that these are the very tip tops of those energetic high-reaching ammonia water thunderstorms that contain the shallow lightning. And what's exciting about the discovery of shallow lightning is that even though it's a high altitude phenomenon, it's actually giving us a link to the mysteries of Jupiter's deep atmosphere. And that's because of the creation of this ammonia water liquid at the high altitudes. It's a piece of evidence that supports the theory that Tristan is now going to explain to you about the hailstones. So I'll hand it over to Tristan. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so thank you, Heidi. So we can go to the next slide where I show the motivation uh, for the work that I will present. It's really this uh, uh, image of Jupiter that you see on the left and on the right you have the Juno data uh, from four years ago actually that showed us that the ammonia which is represented here in color is uh, uh, has an abundance that's variable. It's high deep in the atmosphere and can be very low um, in most of the atmosphere and it depends on latitude. You see that this, this little shell is just expanded from a thin shell on Jupiter here. Um, so we have a very surprising uh, latitude dependent ammonia abundance that's, uh, um, that's there to great depths, 200 kilometers or more tens of bars. And this is something that we have to explain. We've understood it's not due to zonal flows on the planet. And we have a model that explains it. Uh, with storms, very small events uh, uh, compared to the size of Jupiter. Next slide. So when you compare Earth and Jupiter, of course, Earth is much larger and its storms are also much larger. Uh, as you can see here on the left, you have a, a, a typical um, large cumulonimbus cloud on the Earth, 12 kilometers high. Uh, on Jupiter, it's six, seven times higher. Uh, so those are real, real monsters. On Earth, from time to time, we have hailstorms, not too often, fortunately. And for that, you need to, to have a, a water as a, a, in a special state as a supercooled liquid so that uh, it can uh, collide and form and grow rapidly to form these uh, hailstones. Well, on Jupiter, what we were able to show is that uh, these large storms are also powered by water condensation, like on Earth. Uh, but then these ice crystals that are lofted, uh, when they get into this region where it's quite cold, minus 100 Celsius almost, they can, uh, uh, the, these water ice crystals combine with the ammonia to form a liquid. Uh, and this allows them to grow and to form these uh, special water ammonia hailstones that we call mush balls. Uh, and this can explain uh, uh, the shallow lightning that Heidi talked about, and it also transports both ammonia and water down in the atmosphere. On the next slide, I'm going to show you an animation of what's happening. We're looking down into one of these storms to uh, discover the ice crystals that have been lofted up. And then a, a, a mush ball is forming. So we formed um, this liquid ammonia water ice. Uh, ammonia is a powerful antifreeze. 
you can see, you could see the lightning and then we're going down in the cloud and collecting ice uh, crystals there it's building a crust uh, around this this mush bowl a solid crust we're falling very rapidly these things can have can weigh two pounds or so fall at 400 uh, miles per hour something like that so and then when they reach uh, in about 10 minutes uh, the bottom of the cloud it's it's warm and and they evaporate um, and dissolve next slide so our model uh, uh, um, matches the observations that are shown on the left here. This is an ammonia map with latitude as a function of pressure. So as you're going down, you're looking deeper in the atmosphere. Uh, colors again, uh, when it's dark, it's low ammonia abundance. So you can see these, these variations. Uh, near the equator, we have a relatively high and uniform ammonia abundance. Well, we're able to reproduce that on the right with our theoretical model. And what we're seeing is that both ammonia and water uh, are predicted to have variable abundance to great depth. And this is interesting because in the next slide, uh, uh, the uh, Galileo probe in 1995 fell into a very particular region of Jupiter uh, called the hotspot. And it fell deep to 20 bars or so and measured the very low water and ammonia abundance. And it was thought that this was due to this hotspot that would be localized deserts. But here, what we're seeing is that the whole region actually uh, is very peculiar with uh, low ammonia and, and water abundances. So, so it gives a new pers perspective uh, to, to analyze these results. And uh, in the next slide, I'll show you this uh, hotspot that we were able to see and have the, the best highest resolution images ever taken of it. So on the, on the left, there's a beautiful infrared image from Gemini on the ground, where you see this hotspot appearing very bright um, uh, because it's a hole in the clouds and we're seeing the deeper atmosphere that's warmer. Uh, in the visible on the right, uh, the, the hotspot is dark. Um, uh, so you can see the correspondence. Uh, what is, is bright on the left is dark on the right. And we're seeing lots of clouds, uh, storms there that are very important to, to explain what's happening uh, in this area. In the, in the next slide, there's another example of a, a, a hotspot from the last perigove of Juno, uh, again, uh, from the ground with IRTF this time and with Juno Cam, and you see a big storm uh, next to the hotspot that's key to interpret the observations. Uh, so that's, that's really something uh, great. And I'm going to uh, give you a, one last slide, which is the hotspot, uh, but this time uh, seen uh, by Juno uh, on the, against the limb. This was done by a citizen scientist. And you can see these uh, white spots are uh, high clouds, probably made of ammonia, in which we believe these mush balls are forming. And with that, I'll uh, pass uh, the floor to Candy. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Yes. Uh, so Scott showed us, uh, showed how Juno's elliptical orbit is evolving. And so with the slow departure over the southern hemisphere, which is the opposite of the quick pass over the northern hemisphere, we get the perspective that I'm showing here. And so we have a lengthy time out as, as the spacecraft leaves Jupiter to uh, see motions in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, just to orient you in this particular image, the big storm near the top is Oval BA, and that is about the size of the Earth. Uh, just below and to the right is one of um, Jupiter's anticyclonic white ovals, and those are very common at this latitude. You can see another one over further to the right, closer to the limb. So we've continued our really fruitful uh, collaboration with amateur image processors and astronomers and artists this year. And I'm going to first show a couple of examples of some of the science going on uh, using JunoCam images and led by uh, amateur citizen scientists, uh, but there's many more. So if I could have the next slide, please. The slow departure over the Southern Hemisphere means that we get multiple images that are spaced enough in time to actually see clouds moving. 
And so using the, that motion, uh, John Rogers has been mapping out the uh, wind directions and um, one of the things that's sort of particularly interesting is uh, the circulation labeled the STB Spectre on the right-hand side there. All of these acronyms are spelled out in the caption for this image. But the thing about the STB Spectre is that it's, it's really spread out in longitude, but confined in latitude, and it's rotating uh, in a cyclonic direction. The next slide, please. Here's another uh, example that you might have seen on social media, actually. This came out around the time of Parage of 27. <clears throat> Clyde Foster, who is an amateur astronomer in South Africa, took the picture uh, with his backyard telescope that you see in the lower left. And he discovered a storm and a new one. And uh, so that's that bright feature pretty much in the center of the Junocom image. Uh, just below and to the right of the great red spot. So Clyde contacted me and um, I was able to assure him that we had a, an image planned at the correct location. And not only uh, did we have uh, our normal red, green, blue image planned, we also had one taken through our methane image. That's the other insert there that shows that this cloud, this storm is bright at methane wavelengths and that tells us that it's high in Jupiter's atmosphere. The next slide, please. And then here's another one. I call this the plethora of storms because it's just all through every latitude. And um, so again, these uh, abbreviations are spelled out in the caption. Uh, but the point is that these are storms that are last from weeks to months to years and the collaboration between Juno and the amateur astronomy community means that they are tracking these things day after day after day. Then we zoom in, Juno zooms in and gets close-up shots. <clears throat> so um, I won't go through each and every one of them, but I will just say that the one up near the top that's labeled NNWS4, uh, that is North North White Spot 4. That is about the distance across that a flight from Cedar Rapids, Iowa to Honolulu would be, just to give you an idea of the distance. Uh, the next slide. So now I'm going to take you to the North Pole. These are the, um, oh, someone needs to get rid of that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, these are the Northern Circumpolar Cyclones. Scott showed you the ones in the South. Uh, there are eight. They, this has been stable since uh, Jupiter uh, Juno arrived at Jupiter. Um, no interlopers up in the up in the northern hemisphere. Uh, Juno Cam can only see these when they're sunlit, so it takes us um, a number of perijoves to to get images of all eight. And so you can see this is made of four perijove passes, twenty five through twenty eight, and in the center we're just beginning to see the North Pole emerge into daylight. It's been, it was in polar night when Juno first arrived at Jupiter. Now it's emerging into the daylight. And um, as the subsolar latitude uh, on Jupiter moves northward, Jupiter's equinox, it will occur in May of next year. The next slide, please. I love this view on the right because it really gives you the feeling that Juno is swooping over close to the Northern Hemisphere, just like Scott showed in his first slide. And so you see uh, in the image on the right, on the left-hand side, you can see three of the circumpolar cyclones, the Northern circumpolar cyclones. And then uh, as your eye goes up to the top right, there's an area of a lot of turbulence that finally then gives way to the familiar uh, belts and zones that we expect with Jupiter. Uh, the image on the left is a close-up view of one of those northern circumpolar cyclones. So you can see the kind of detail that we're getting as the spacecraft gets closer and closer. Next slide, please. 
this is an animation of five of the images that we uh, got going over the North Pole in our latest Perijove Pass. And so this is um, showing two of the big northern circumpolar cyclones. There's lots of motion in this, uh, but to draw your eye to those two, you can see how the outer clouds are rotating counterclockwise. The inner ones are rotating clockwise. So that's rather strange that we have these counter rotating clouds. We think it has to do with the vertical structure and that maybe these clouds are at different levels and in the atmosphere. And we're looking forward to getting uh, microwave data uh, soon uh, so that we can see just how deep the roots go. Okay, uh, the next slide, I'm going to change gears radically here and just show you uh, one of the beautiful pieces of art that has been contributed. This one is by Nav Navanith Krishnan. And you may recognize this is um, a slice from the image that I showed, uh, my first image that I showed. That's oval BA. And it's one of the anticyclonic white ovals to below and to the right, the bright white spot. But this is how Jupiter looks to an artist. So this is a different expression of how we see Jupiter. And um, the next slide is just one more example. We have so many wonderful examples, uh, but this is really has to be one of my new favorites. And um, this is by Rita Najem and it's, uh, she titles it, Roses on Jupiter. So I'll let you, I'm gonna stop talking for a second, let you guys absorb this and uh, that will finish out my segment then. So we can go ahead then. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you so much panelists. That was really wonderful. So now we'll move on to the Q&A portion. So reporters, if you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A box that's separate from the chat box. And please remember to state your full name and affiliation. And my colleague Liza will um, read the questions to the panelists. Do we have any in the queue yet, Liza? Or do we need to wait a minute? Sorry, I had a cat bomb there. We do have one in the queue. Sorry. For Dr. Bolton, Harvey Life Freelancer asks, has NASA authorized an extended mission yet? And if so, what are the goals? And secondly, have you learned more about the size and nature of Jupiter's core than at your last AGU press conference? Okay. Um, I'll, I, it says type an answer in the question and answer box, but I'll give it verbally. But uh, so Harvey, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, they have not finished uh, the analysis and, uh, and decisions on authorizing our extended mission. We did propose it and put a, put a large proposal in together uh, earlier in the fall. It just went through a, a review and uh, I expect that they'll give us an answer uh, on authorization uh, in the near future, but I'm not sure exactly which day. Um, you can see uh, some of the plans that are possible in the extended mission in a poster that I have uh, on the, in the session that's called New Results from Juno. Um, you have to look up the poster that's under my name because uh, originally it was gonna be an overview of the uh, results. And, um, but after we completed the extended mission proposal, I thought that would be more interesting. And so um, you can take a look at that poster and you can see the possible science that we uh, outlined and it and it has a quite a bit of new science in it that are great and you can also see that the uh, orbit continues to evolve and we get closer and closer to the poles uh, and and uh, in the extended mission um, for the second question have we learned much more about the jupiter's core and uh, we have uh, we continue to model uh, both the gravity field and, uh, and our uh, understanding of, of the Dilute core and, and what constraints it might have. And, 
And what we've learned a lot in the last year is how important it is to combine the atmosphere and the magnetic field and the gravity field science all together. They're all interacting. Jupiter's interior is interacting with its deep atmosphere and these different force fields are all dictating uh, probably what's going on and helping us characterize uh, what that dilute core looks like. Um, in particular, uh, we've seen uh, effects on the magnetic field features that seem to be stretched or pushed around by deep winds. Um, a lot of the, we, we've made some new measurements on the gravity field, of course, uh, since last year. We haven't incorporated those into publications yet, and there's a lot more of this data uh, that would come from an extended mission as well. Uh, and so, but the big piece of the, the big story with respect to that is that um, Jupiter's core is likely dictated by this interaction of, of, uh, of the deep atmosphere and the interior in many ways. And, the, and all of these force fields, the magnetic field, the deep winds, and the gravity uh, field data all have to be looked at uh, in an interdisciplinary fashion to probably answer all of this. But thanks for your question. I don't know if there are there others. No more questions yet, but let's give everyone just a couple of minutes to think about their questions and write them in the Q&A box. Last call for questions. Anyone have one? Go ahead and type it in before we close it out. All right, well, it looks like that's all the formal questions that we have. Oh, nope, sorry, there's one from Fran. Go ahead. Uh, so go ahead, Liza. Yeah, so Fran is asking, how likely is it that a probe entering Jupiter's atmosphere would be hit by lightning? So I'm not sure who that's aimed at, but I'll take a crack at it and then uh, Heidi and Tristan can comment. Um, so, you know, the Galileo probe that went in did have a lightning detector on it. Um, and there's a little bit of data from that. But the probability of, uh, of lightning hitting the pr a probe going in, um, I personally have no uh, seen no calculation that actually goes in and figures that out. Uh, that is something that we might be able to do as we gather a lot more data. Um, you know, we have an occurrence rate of lightning, and, um, but hitting such a small target would be tough. Uh, to try to analyze, in my opinion. Um, although maybe it would be a little bit like a lightning rod. <laughs> so the statistics could change. Um, but it's a good question because I think from, um, from the recent data that you know both Heidi and Tristan have, have looked at as far as the importance of the storms, but also the new data that we have uh, where we've seen this high resolution image of hotspots does suggest that that region is is uh, does have lightning and storms in it. Uh, that's consistent with with uh, Tristan's models and his results. Um, and that's not where most you know we see more lightning coming from the further north north we go. And um, and so I think where the probe goes in will change that probability. So, and that may change over time. Right now, it looks like the Northern Hemisphere up the, the mid latitudes to, you know, maybe near 50, 60 degrees North has the most lightning. And so if you dropped a probe in there, it might have a, a, a much better chance of getting hit. Although I don't know if you want it to get hit by lightning. <laughs> uh, I'll open the door to Heidi or Tristan if you wanna add anything. Yeah, I would, I would say that 
for a, a single probe at a particular moment at a random place on the planet, it, it probably isn't too likely um, from what we know now. Um, because a probe is very small compared to the surface area of Jupiter. And uh, as Scott said, we don't see lightning everywhere. So you kind of have to go into uh, a stormy place for that to happen. Something that's um, interesting and that we don't yet understand is that if you go at the equator, uh, it seems there's almost no lightning. We, uh, we never see lightning. Uh, whereas if you go um, uh, high in, at higher latitude, especially in the north, there's more lightning. Of course, the probability for a probe to be struck by lightning is very, very small. Um, but the key thing here is that, yes, there's uh, very little lightning and uh, very little storms at the equator. And this is something that we don't understand. It seems to be in line with what we're seeing at Saturn as well, uh, and maybe on other planets. And I believe it's key for the interpretation of the ammonia water abundance. So it could be something very important also to uh, understand uh, planets around other stars when we're you know, not seeing their surface features, but only a, a, an average spectrum. Uh, so we need to understand the mechanisms that are responsible for the uh, transport of the species in the atmosphere and um, where storms happen or not. So, so it's, it's really important to uh, concentrate on Jupiter and to understand the meteorology of these planets much better. Let, let me add one more thing that I thought of while Tristan was answering, and that is... Um, it is very important to realize that the equator is this unique area, but it's also a very small region, um, you know, with respect to all over Jupiter. So if you didn't want to get hit by lightning, you might want to go into that equator region. Um, of course, uh, you might be measuring something that's different than everywhere else. And so it depends on what your goal is. But one of the things I thought of is that um, assuming the probe goes in somewhere other than the equatorial region, it may have a, a greater likelihood of, of getting hit by a mush ball than getting hit by lightning. And, uh, and in fact, it might be more disastrous to have a, a two pound mush ball coming down at uh, 400 miles an hour hit you. I'd have to calculate how fast the probe went down, but, it, but uh, originally the Galileo probe had a parachute to slow it down and the mush ball's got no parachute. Yeah, absolutely. So Harvey Leifert asks, is there any new information on Jupiter's third magnetic pole? So um, I'm not sure what's meant by the third magnetic pole unless you are, are you thinking about the great blue spot? Um, there is a very significant feature in the magnetic field uh, that we call the great blue spot. It's actually not that far from the great red spot. It's just the, it's in the south, just slightly south. Of course, the magnetic field goes around uh, every 10 hours uh, or so during with Jupiter's rotation. In fact, that's how we define uh, Jupiter's rotation in, in what we call system three. And the great red spot is literally blowing in the wind. So it only you know doesn't line up all the time. But the new information I would say on the magnetic pole is that um, as we got higher, as we were getting higher resolution uh, magnetic field maps of that region, we can see that it's distorting. That that magnetic pole uh, or great blue spot has a distortion because part of it, it's getting caught up, what appears to be caught up in the jet streams where one is moving westward, westerly and the other one in the bottom of it is moving easterly. And so I might have it backwards there, uh, but one side is moving to the west and one side is moving to the east. And so you see this stretching occurring in the magnetic field configuration. And that's what's giving us the clue uh, that, that the deep winds are probably affecting the magnetic field configuration. And uh, there's a lot of science in that. So in the extended mission, and even now throughout the rest of the primary mission, we're getting more data that on higher resolution data on the magnetic field so that we can explore that. It could be that in the Northern hemisphere, where there's a lot of magnetic structure, we may see also hints of, of this uh, streaming being stretched by deep winds. 
Um, and so some of, uh, some of that's still to, to be dis discovered. And the extended mission offers a lot of opportunity of that where we have a whole campaign on that third magnetic pole to try to understand it and see how it's changing. Um, so it's a very interesting place. And Harvey confirms that he was asking about the blue spot, so thank you. Nigel Angold is asking, why do you call them mush balls? In reference to that last question before Harvey's question. So I'm gonna let uh, Tristan answer that. Um, it came from, what, the, the name came from one of our colleagues, but it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, yeah, the, the name came from uh, Dave Stevenson originally. Uh, and the idea is that uh, when you uh, you create this uh, this liquid from ammonia and water at, at very low temperatures, you know minus uh, eighty to minus one hundred Celsius, uh, you're creating a sort of mush. It's a very high viscosity liquid, um, and uh, so, so it doesn't behave like a, a normal liquid. And so that's why uh, we, we call them uh, mush balls. Um, and then the idea is once you, you, you have this, this mush and then it, it grows and falls, have you seen, have you, you've seen in the, the animation, uh, and it's about able to collect uh, this uh, water ice crust and become uh, uh, even larger. So those should be quite, uh, uh, quite large uh, uh, beasts and uh, I wouldn't like to be uh, underneath a Jupiter storm, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, Tristan. It, I mean, the, you got it all right with the mush part. Um, it's more like a slushy hail and, and mush was, uh, was a good thing. But, but Dave, when he was uh, thinking of this, I think he related it to some breakfast food that he had <laughs> when he was younger that was like mushy. Um, I don't remember the exact, uh, whether it was like an oatmeal like thing or something that uh, he grew up with. And um, he told us that story and um, we kind of liked the whole connection. I don't know if you would ever eat a mush ball for breakfast though. All right, well, it's more past 11.45 now, so we'll go ahead and close out the press conference. Thank you again to, so much for our panelists for sharing your work with us. Thank you to reporters for attending. So we'll now close out and we'll open up that informal discussion room and a link to that is in the chat along with the passcode. So if you'd like to stick around and talk to the panelists a little bit more, um, you can go ahead and click on that link and head over. And so this will conclude our press conference and our next press conference will be today at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you very much.